Thank you, Pastor Matt. Thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning. I just want to take a moment uh, before we open God's Word together and just bring you a, a brief update. Um, last week, I shared an update of one of the ways that we can help those in need in our community uh, through an uh, important project. It's called the GEAR Project that is being sponsored by ICC, um, and it's a project that is uh, specifically geared at helping uh, those who need it the most uh, here in Peoria, who need help uh, getting jobs, uh, finding opportunity in neighborhoods and areas that have not had the same opportunity that many of us have had in, in our homes. And so um, in this project, I've received some, con some information from ICC, but more importantly, um, I've been talking with our really partner church, New Beginnings Ministries, Pastor uh, Martin Johnson, and uh, we, in, in the course of talking, uh, he's asking that we would partner with their church, and we're going to do that uh, throughout this time. One of the things in the project, I'll just read it here, it says, over the next four weeks, ICC staff will work with community-based and religious organizations, schools, neighborhood associations, and employees to identify potential students that may benefit and qualify for the program. Um, so this is going to include uh, outreach, recruitment, college and career guidance and advisement, uh, assessment, testing, tuition assistance, assistance with prior tuition debt, laptop, internet service, case management, tutoring, instructory, instruction, uh, instructional uh, aid, safe places to study and receive te technological support. So really bringing education to some neighborhoods that people who live there may not be able to have access transportation, a safe place to study. So it's a wonderful, wonderful project uh, that we get to be a part of. Some of you have already shared last week, Pastor, I'd like to participate. Um, and I'm getting a little bit more information. Uh, Pastor Marty let, met with ICC and others, and right now they're really putting this together. But uh, their church in the Averville neighborhood, New Beginnings Ministries, will be a host site where students can come in and uh, for a few hours be able to pursue those educational opportunities, laptops, technology provided, tutoring, help, uh, to really help create opportunities for jobs. So wonderful program. Pastor Marty said that what would be very helpful would, it, would be if we could have some volunteers from Peoria Nazarene who could commit to a time. Uh, I don't have the, 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 the definite times yet. I will probably this week, but it's likely to be weekdays, sometime from maybe 10 in the morning to 3 but it'll be during the day, just an opportunity to come and be there to help if needed with tech support. Um, but I'm also talking to Pastor Marty, how can we further incentivize this? What can Peoria Nazarene do? And so it's one of those wonderful ways we have in this time to not just think about our needs, but to think beyond how we can help those who need these educational opportunities the most. So stay tuned. Um, thank you for reaching out. Again, if you have interest, uh, let me know or let uh, our office call the office. And then as I receive information from Pastor Marty, uh, we're going to work together on this wonderful, wonderful opportunity to support our community and ICC in this great endeavor. Uh, I want to ask a question. We're going to get back into the series today. We're, we're finishing up this series that I've called Life in the Spirit, Following Jesus in Today's World. And we've been in Romans chapter 12, and we're going to basically conclude today about halfway through chapter 15. And then uh, we're going to move on from here to a new series. So I want to pause and just tell you a little bit about how I believe God is leading for our next series that's, that's coming up. And I, I've really had this idea as I've been praying on my mind of the need for encouragement. Um, the need uh, to kind of flip the script. The script has been all negative. It's been a lot of bad news that's going on, a lot of stress, and there is a real need for encouragement. You know, one of the ways I've seen this recently is just all parents is we're still kind of waiting. We don't really know for sure what's going to happen with school. Everybody's still in this place. We're being told things. Teachers are, have a tremendous burden on them right now. You know, uh, our administrators, tremendous burdens on them. Uh, on trying to provide education from uh, home, but also in the facility, adapting new things, not always having all the support they need to do that. And, and it'd be really easy for us as a church and as people, because we're all frustrated, we're all tired of all this. It'd be really easy for us to just vent that a little bit to a teacher, our kid's teacher. This is just, and just to, to speak those negative words. And I think what we're hungry for 
And what the world needs so much is encouragement, good news. Good news lifts the heart. It doesn't mean we put our head in the sand and don't acknowledge things, but rather we have hope. We know there is hope in times such as this. So we're going to be speaking specifically about that and and maybe doing some things to commit together as a church family practically how we can speak life during these days and especially during this time. And I'm convinced God's going to use us when we speak life to our neighbors when we speak life to our friends, when we speak life to our enemies, when we speak life, God will use us. So I believe God's leading us there. Um, also preparing a series uh, together with Pastor Marty Johnson on the topic of racial reconciliation. And we're thinking about calling that healing conversations, talking about our friendship. And so that's upcoming. We don't have a time for that, but an area that we believe that God's leading us. So I'm very much excited. We're talking about Pastor Marty coming and both of us together, speaking together about that. And I think that'll be a very timely message coming in the future. Um, But for today, we're going to finish Romans chapter 15. I want to begin by asking you a question. How would you spend your time if if you knew, if you were told right now that you only have 24 hours left to live? What would you do? So right now, I'm looking at the time. It's about 5 till 11. This time tomorrow, it's over. What would you do? Clock's ticking right now. You know, when we're kids, there'd be all kinds of funny things we'd share. And uh, I can even remember a family member of mine who was allergic to shellfish and absolutely loved shrimp. Loved shrimp so much, but in his 40s, he developed an allergy. And this family member of mine would always say, man, if I had 24 hours to live, and if it's going to be over... I'm going to go get myself some cocktail shrimp, and I'm going to just feast on that. Then I'm going to go have some crawfish. I'm going to have some crabs, lobster. I'm just going to gorge myself on all those things. So we can chuckle that maybe we'd want filet filet mignon. Maybe we'd jump out of a plane. Maybe we'd do something. But on the serious side of that, there's a lot of other things we would think about. Who would you call? What would you say? What would you pray? What would you do? You know what's fascinating in Scripture? We know of one man who knew he had 24 hours left to live. Jesus was very clear from the beginning of his ministry that he knew that his life would culminate not in this tragic, unexpected death. No, Jesus knew the whole reason he was coming was to give his life as a ransom for many. Was to die sacrificially. Even the Old Testament prophets spoke of his death by crucifixion, not even fully knowing what they were talking about. Jesus knew. And so in Jesus' last 24 hours, knowing full well that he would embrace the bitter suffering of the cross, what did Jesus do? I'm not going to go all into this, but a great place to look would be into John's Gospel. And we can basically see that Jesus spends time in prayer with his Father. He spends time worshiping his father, asking his father that that, that he would be able to honor his father's name, that his father's will would be done, even through his suffering, that God would give Jesus and his humanity the ability to endure that suffering, not my will, but yours be done. And then we see in the Olivet Discourse in John's Gospel, Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's investing in them. Don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm coming again. He's teaching them But then in John 17, he prays for them. And it's really what's in the heart of the prayer of Jesus that I want to focus on. I'm just going to read a couple of those verses before we get back into Romans. John 17, verse 20. Hear the word of the Lord. This is Jesus again, moments before, knowing he's going to die. He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, and that you love them as much as you love me. Jesus, moments before his death, knowing full well 
He's praying for the unity, not just of Peter, James, and John, and all the other disciples, for those who believe, for Peoria Nazarene today, all who will believe. He's praying that we would be one, fully united. You know, we can chuckle a bit because uh, not just this church, but all churches, we have a history of not doing this very well. Every generation of the church, all the way back to even the book of Acts, we read that this is a challenge. The church has always wrestled with realities to seek to live this out. I, I read a humorous story I wanted to share with you. It says, there's a story of two congregations that were lo located only a few blocks from each other in a small community. They thought it might be better if they would merge and become one united, larger, and more effective body rather than two struggling churches. Seems like a really good idea, doesn't it? Come together. But they were not able to pull it off. What was the problem? They could not agree on how they would recite the Lord's Prayer. One group preferred, forgive us our trespasses, while the other group demanded, forgive us our debts. So as the local newspaper reported, quote, one church went back to its trespasses, while the other returned to its debts. That's pretty humorous, but we could chuckle at that. And we can be honest with ourselves that our own passions at times, even me, all of us, even all of us who are Christians, we, we get pulled into those categories. But Jesus has prayed that we would be one. I want to share the simple truth with you that we're going to see in our passage today in Romans 15. It's this, God does not want peripheral differences to divide us. This idea of peripheral is, is outer perimeter, not, not core, central doctrinal, uh, import, of, of essential importance. These are matters on the outside. God does not want those kind of differences to divide us. Rather, we must pray for unity and we must love each other because Christ loves all of us. This is such an important truth. I'm going to open again God's Word, Romans 15, 1-13, and you can follow along in your Bible on the screen. I'm going to read this together. Romans 1, Romans 15, starting in verse 1. Paul says, We who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't live to please Himself. As the Scriptures say, the insults of those who insent insult you, O God, have fallen on me. Such things were writ written in the Scriptures long ago to teach us. And the Scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises He made to their ancestors. He also came so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for His mercies to them. That is what the psalmist meant when he wrote, quote, For this I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. And, another, and in another place it is written, Rejoice with his people, you Gentiles. And yet again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Praise him, all you people of the earth. And in another place, Isaiah said, The heir to David's throne will come and he will rule over the Gentiles. They will place their hope on him. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then, then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. May it be so, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we hear your word, we agree together that 
we stand under your word. I stand under your word. It's our prayer that we would rightly understand what it is that you were saying through Paul to the Roman Christians. We'd ask that we'd rightly understand that so that we might understand today what it is you would say to us here at Peoria Nazarene today through your spirit. Your word endures forever. It gives life. It is living and active. Would you quicken that word to our hearts today? Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Oh God, we pray. Amen. I'd like to share from this passage two essential ingredients for unity in non-essential issues. First essential ingredient that the Apostle Paul gives us in this passage, looking at verses 1 through 6, is humility. Humility is essential for the church to pray for unity and love each other in spite of differences on peripheral issues. So important that we embrace unity or, or, or hum, we embrace unity by embracing humility. Humility is seen ultimately in the first few verses that Paul speaks about is the example of Christ. We are to follow in loving and accepting each other because that's precisely what the Lord Jesus has done for us. Jesus did not please himself, but rather Jesus gives his life. He humbles himself, and that humility is shown in bearing our burdens. We who are sinners, we who are lost, we who are so lost in our sins that there's no hope of salvation in and of ourselves. Jesus comes and he bears our sins, our burdens to Calvary so that we might be redeemed, so that we might have life, so we might live in fullness of life here in this world, but all the more in eternity with our God. Paul appeals to the church, specifically the church in Rome that is dealing with divisions in non-essential issues. And Paul specifically begins in verses 1-6 through six, speaking to the strong. And if you missed out on last Sunday, I just want to very briefly bring you up to speed. We talked about the dangers of a judgmental spirit specifically in this issue that was going on in Rome. And here this issue in the Roman church centered around a division between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. It was a division that was forming. It wasn't on an essential issue. They all, together in the Roman church, had come to believe that Jesus is Lord. They had come to believe that, as Paul's spoken about already in Romans, that the gospel of God is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. It's the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. We are justified freely by His grace. In Him we have forgiveness. Because Jesus is Lord. He is God. He's the perfect man as well who died for us and we find life in Him. These essential issues of, of, of who Jesus is, the gospel, who we are, our sins, these essential issues weren't dividing the Jewish and the Gentile Christians. They agreed together on these issues. Where they were dividing is a debate over specific things that are non-essential. Food laws of the Old Testament. You see, the Jewish Christians had come, come to a place where they knew that those weren't essential for salvation, but they wanted to please Jesus, and they had done these things for so long in their conscience. Their conscience wouldn't let them eat these foods, although, as Paul has said, Jesus declared all foods clean. The new covenant reality of Jesus, all foods are clean to eat. But yet, in their conscience, they couldn't do it. And then there was disputes over holy days. We don't know what days those are. They could be certain days on the Jewish calendar, but it wasn't just that. It probably was over the Sabbath. Do we worship on Saturday? Or do we worship on Sunday? The Jewish Christians would have preferred Saturday, whereas the Gentile Christians, because the Lord was raised on Sunday, they would prefer Sunday. And so there were these debates. And one thing Paul does is so significant in the church is he emphasizes that more important than being right or winning the other side to your position, it is far more important that we love one another. As we saw last week, we will stand before God, before His judgment seat. Each one of us will stand before Christ who is perfect love and justice. And we'll give an account, and it won't just be if we're on the right side of the debate. It'll be how we treated each other. 
Did we love? Or did we embrace a judgmental spirit? So we considered that specifically last week. Here, once again, Paul emphasizes humility, that the burden is on the strong, that the strong must bear the burden of the weak and to seek to build them up, not just win them over to their side. One commentator says it this way, if both groups in this division in the Roman church are seeking to serve the other side, the conflict will take care of itself. That's Paul's point. If we would love and serve one another and embrace unity that God does not want us to divide on non-essential issues, then the conflict will take care of itself. We must not live to please ourselves, but to please Jesus Christ. This is our starting point. You know, a lot of those divisive issues that we face in our day, you know where our starting point often is? Events that happen in our culture, our society, come to us through the news. Oftentimes through the news that is being filtered to us through a political lens, right? One side or the other. And it's so easy for followers of Jesus to think that our starting place is our political position on an issue. But I want you to hear very clearly the Word of God. Our starting place is not politics. Our starting place and our ending place as a church is this, pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ. Can we agree on that? We don't start with politics. We believe our understanding of God should inform how we engage in those things, but we don't declare allegiance to a political party. So thankful to know, can I get an amen on this? There won't be any Democrats or Republicans in heaven. Can we get an amen, please? These temporary realities of living in a fallen world, the division, we live to please Jesus Christ. We do not start with politics. Here's some of you chuckling. Maybe I ought to reframe that. There will be Democrats and Republicans in heaven, right? But we won't bear those titles. We won't bear those titles. The truest identity of our relationship with Christ will be what defines us. So we live to please Jesus Christ. I want to put up again the prayer. One thing that's fascinating about this particular passage, so we've got two main units here, verses 1 through 6 and verse 7 through 13. And But at the end of each unit, the Apostle Paul is writing these things, and it's like he just breaks out in prayer. He does. He prays two prayers to end each unit. Look at this prayer. This is at the end. This is verse 6. So as he's speaking on these very things, he says, may God who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice giving praise and glory to God the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you realize God wants us in one voice to worship Him? He does not want us to divide over non-essential Peripheral issue, issues. We are to keep the unity, pray for the unity, and specifically the prayer is that we would worship in one voice. This is only possible when humility is at the core of our hearts. That's why Paul appeals to the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if I'm somebody on the weak side of this debate, I'm not going to look down and consider the Gentiles is a bunch of heathens who are just running around doing whatever they want and not adhering to these more holy laws that they embrace. I won't look down. I'll try to empathetically learn where they're coming from with that position. Same is true, flip it the other way around, if I'm on the, the strong side of the Gentile Christians here and I have freedom and I know I don't need to do these things, if I'm listening with empathy, I'm going to try to really understand where these Jewish Christians are coming from. I'm going to be humble enough to listen. And, and yes, because these things matter so much to them in their conscience, I'm going to be willing to limit even my liberty because Jesus limited His rights for me. So I'm willing to help and to uphold the weak. Who should bear the greater burden? That's what Paul gets at. Paul makes it clear the greater burden is on the strong to bear those who are weak because we want to build each other up in the faith. Humility is essential. I want to look at the second ingredient together this morning. 
Second ingredient that will guide us specifically uh, through difficult times, but also enable us to stay united is hope. We need humility and we need hope. And we can see this in verses 7 through 13. Hope enables us to love each other in spite of our differences. You see, what the Apostle Paul does is he speaks specifically about an heir of David will come. He talks from the Old Testament through Psalms about how God accepts and loves. The Gentiles were part of God's plan just as much as the Jewish people were part of God's plan. And he calls them together. He appeals to the reality that God loves and accepts both of them in Christ. And he's calling them to focus on the common ground of Jesus, who is the heir of David. The actual language behind this is this root of Jesse, this Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. And it's like what, in the midst of this contentious debate over silly matters of eating food or not eating food or which day of the week or not, Paul is calling them, embrace the larger truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Focus on the larger reality that holds us together in unity. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the descendant of David, has come for all people. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Let that hope be at the center that enables us to unite. And in these non-essential issues, this is fascinating. Paul's not saying, he is saying that I'm on the side of the strong. Paul includes himself in that. And he says, I do believe this is the right understanding of Scripture. But Paul is actually saying, look, it's not about trying to convince you to my position in this non-essential issue. It's about in love coming together as one, embracing this larger reality of the hope we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Paul challenges them to. He says that Jesus gives hope. He gives joy and peace. And as we trust in Him, this is the key word, as we trust in Him, He gives joy and peace. This refers to an internal harmony that comes from God through His Spirit filling us. So if we're going to have external harmony with other people, we're going to need God's internal harmony in us, holding on to humility and hope that would fill our hearts. And what Paul's saying is they need the Spirit to specially empower them to bring this peace and joy. And Paul places that this is the answer that will solve the conflict between these two warring factions in the church. Paul says this work of grace only comes as you trust in Christ, which means total dependence. Both sides of this issue, the Jewish Christians, the Gentile Christians, together they must place their total dependence, their trust. That's what trust means. Total dependence on Christ and receive the hope and the peace and joy that he gives both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians in Rome as they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Only when both sides live by the power of the Holy Spirit is it possible for there to be this kind of love, this kind of unity. Paul says this. He says we don't just have hope. Did you catch the language? He says we overflow with it. Our hearts overflow that this hope becomes infectious and enables us to see beyond the differences that often divide us. So this is the situation in Rome. And I've looked, we've looked together today at these two essential ingredients of unity. We've seen this, this main idea today um, that I've brought before you that God does not want peripheral differences to divide us. We must pray for unity and love each other because Christ loves us all. And we've seen that if that's going to happen, we have to embrace these two essential ingredients, humility and hope. And we must be focused on those things. Now, if we're to apply this today, I know last week I was preaching in the message and I really just felt God leading me. I believed he was leading me to not get specific. And I had somebody last week say to me, Pastor, uh, I was talking to my spouse and we were just chatting a little bit. You know he's not talking about food laws. He's talking about whether I should wear a mask or not. And, and, I, and I really believed as I was preparing the message, no, I'm going to apply these things the best I can. 
But we have to wrestle with those things because those things are in our minds. How do we respond to the political divide in our country today? How do we interact with what is going on with the, all of us are so weary and tired of 2020 and what's happening? How do we as a church, knowing that in the body of Jesus, we don't all see these things the same way? We don't. There's differences of opinion. We're interpreting data in different ways. So how do we navigate through these times? And I think it's important that we do seek to prayerfully preserve the unity of the Spirit. We need to be really careful, very, very careful, that we don't divide over non-essential issues. It's easier at times to just divide. But I believe, and I really believe this, if we're to be faithful to God's Word, it's to really love. Do you realize when Paul says you must accept each other? When I hear that, you know what I hear? I just got to put up with somebody, right? Right? That is not what the word means. It's to value as equal. It's to love and view that person as equally loving. You know, some of you may have had a bad interaction somewhere out in the public, and I'll share one thing that one particular occasion I uh, went somewhere, we were uh, following some guidelines, and uh, son had a mask on, and somebody came up to my son and basically said the phrase, kind of called him an idiot for wearing a mask. And, you know, so my son was telling me this over dinner. And you know what I did in that moment? I kind of felt that fatherly anger come up. Bubble, 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 bubble. I said, you know, son, sometimes people are just idiots. And then I had that moment where all of a sudden it went, <laughs> that's called the Holy Spirit. <laughs> where all of a sudden it was, you just called somebody an idiot who called you an idiot. Is that the Spirit of Jesus? No. Okay. And it was in that moment that I backed up and I said, son, no, we disagree. We're interpreting the facts differently. That wasn't right for that person to say that. They shouldn't have said that. But we can't control other people. We have to follow what we know, what we believe to be the right thing to do. So I had to back down. Your father was wrong. I said those phrases. That spirit in me that wanted to call somebody an idiot. So, uh, anyways, um, how many of you want to raise your hand and say you've wanted to call somebody an idiot during this time? Don't raise your hands. We're not going to go there. But it's easy. I've seen it both ways. I've seen it both ways. And I'm just going to talk uh, a little more candidly about this, taking everything I say with a grain of salt, because I'm not the Holy Spirit. I don't want to go beyond the Word of God, but I think, I think we do need to think about our current reality. You know, um, our church, even as we process these things, this has been the most difficult situation that I've led through by far. Uh, uh, and, and it's a difficult time. And as our regathering team, our church board, these are difficult times. It's such a political year. Having an election coming up, there's things going on. There's this growing pandemic. There's concerns over that. And then there's a lot of different perspectives and divisions around that. We as a church have done our best to fully comply with what we're hearing from our local health department. We've talked about that. Um, we're doing that. Uh, but even with that, we're trying to, to think not politically, but to think about pleasing Jesus. So that's why we've asked that in our gatherings that everybody comply. Because I, as a pastor, have talked to so many people, some who are here today, who've been waiting to come back. But unless these safeguards are in place and being complied to, they don't feel safe. And it's so important that when we think about it, politically, I'm going to hold to my position on either side of a debate. But when I think about it in terms of pleasing Jesus, like, you know, it, all of a sudden it doesn't just become an argument over the facts, it becomes an awareness of my brother or my sister. And so many people in our church family who are vulnerable who feel safe when people wear masks. So that's precisely why our regathering team, it's why I've asked that everybody 100% comply. It's not to demonize. It's not to put down. It's not to get into a political debate about facts, because I know there's debates about those things that go on. And have you ever seen one of these debates on Facebook convince somebody to the other side? Nope, not once. But we're taking this very seriously. We're trusting our health department. We're abiding fully. But here's been my appeal. Love for Jesus. Love for my weaker brother. Places the burden on me. I'm young. I'm strong. <laughs> I'm probably going to be okay. I could probably take quite a few viruses and be okay because of the season of life. I don't have pre-existing conditions. I'm healthy. 
But we do things out of love and concern because there's other people who that's not true of. So that may mean me limiting my liberty specifically. Now, hear this. It doesn't mean that I have to become convinced of the other side's position. Paul makes that point. It's not about winning the person over the facts. No, I limit my liberty because of love for others. You know, I... I, I so I just think that we have to think about these things, and I bring them up not because I want to get political. It's the furthest thing from my mind. I don't believe politics belong in the pulpit, but we live to please the Lord. And if we can think and serve and sacrifice for each other, wow, worshiping together in one voice, as Paul says, is far more important. You know, it's interesting, I was thinking about that. And I wonder why Paul didn't just say, hey, I got an idea. Jewish Christians get to worship on Saturday. You get to use the building or the home on Saturday, and this is a great idea. We're going to have the Gentile Christians worship over here on Sunday. And guess what? When you do a potluck with the Jewish Christians, guess what? Don't eat those, those particular meats and things. When the Gentiles get together, man, have everything you want. Pig out, roast a hog, do whatever you want. Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't think pragmatically about it. He says, oh no. He calls us together. That's what it means to be a church. It doesn't mean to agree on everything. We're not going to. But I'll tell you, could we all confess the Spirit? Because I've, it's been there. I've wanted to get so frustrated. I want to say, how can you call, you know, and I've seen it both ways. Idiots are just, that's what Paul's warning against. Don't embrace that. Don't embrace that spirit. Let the love of Jesus bring us together. So if we are going to make it through these times, if we're going to, to preserve the unity and hear God's call to not divide over peripheral issues, then we have to embrace humility and hope. Hold on to these things. Cling to the larger truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These things that we're facing in our culture, they're going to pass away. That's good news. Not going to be here forever. So let's let the Spirit of Jesus guide us through these times. I want us to close in prayer together. Father, we live to please you. And Father, I know in my heart that your word says that one day I will stand before you for the very things I teach. And I'll stand before Jesus and I'll give an account. And Father, uh, our desire has been to try to understand what your word might be saying to us today. It's not been to side politically or to think about things that way. It's been rather to think through the lens of love Father, I pray that you would forgive me. I know you already have for that moment. <laughs> but I pray that your Holy Spirit would, in love, convince us of our, our need of grace, each one of us. That's the larger truth beyond even the dividing times we find ourselves in. It's this larger hope that we all know we're sinners. We all know we're lost. We all know we need Jesus. We all know our knowledge is limited but we want to love and serve you, Jesus, because you've given your life for us. So I want to make space for confession. Jesus, if there's anything that I've said, that we've said this past week or during these times that has not brought honor to your name, that has not furthered your kingdom coming or been in line with your will, we confess that. We ask that you forgive us. Jesus, Jesus, if there's any critical spirit, would you forgive us for that? Would you put within us a new heart that overflows with hope and love? Our world needs to see that we are one because God is one. And they cannot see your love if we divide over non-essential issues. The world needs to know that there's hope right now. 
the world needs to know that although things aren't as they should be in the world, Jesus gave his life to not only redeem fallen people, but to restore fallen creation. And he's coming again. He will make all things new. The world needs the gospel. But it can't hear the gospel if we lose our focus. So Father, would you help us? Father, I pray uh, for all these times we live in, it's together we can pray. Would you heal our land? Father, we, we can pray together for, for all inside the church and outside of the church, and we can seek your will to be done. So Father, I pray as I prayed last week that especially for the strong who are embracing things that aren't necessary for them because of their strength, would you bless them? Would you pour out your blessing on them? And I would pray for the weak that they would see the love of the strong, that we would not look down on each other, but in faith, would our operating, foundational operating principle be to please Jesus. Help us not to react, but help us to live to please you, Jesus, in everything we do. Father, I pray that as we go, that you would guide us, that you would bless us, that you would lead us. And Father, that we would see your hand continue to move in our lives and in this community for the glory of Christ, we pray. Amen.